I wanted to present today some information on the use of the core antibody testing and even mix that in with this search for hepatitis B cure. You're going to hear some editorial comments from me about how I think practice should change, interpretation should change, and I'm going to try to be a little bit provocative so we can uh, have a good discussion at the panel. So thank you very much for having me, and Ray, thanks for uh, <clears throat> allowing me to have this uh, little bit of editorial time as well as presenting um, some data. So my dis disclosures are on my website. The, I couldn't get the font small enough to put on this slide, so to get all the, my affiliations on there. And uh, <clears throat> there'll be a PowerPoint of this on my website as well that's open, open access. So core antibody, very interesting test. You'll see on all these slides about epidemiology that we have two billion people who have ever been exposed to hepatitis B, and that comes from core antibody prevalence studies. But I'm going to try to sell you on the fact that all these patients have hepatitis B. And so instead of saying we've got 257 million infected people, we have actually 2 billion people infected. Just 257 million have surface antigen, according to the recent WHO information. And of course, everyone knows the death and complication rate that we have. So we have a lot of alternate facts and fake news that are going on in the um, newspaper these days. So I'm going to put some out on the table. Hepatitis B is curable, and we've been using this word functional cure, and I acquiesced in collaborations with Tim Block and a number of other people when we published recently to uh, allow the word functional cure to come out, but everyone still recognizes this as an oxymoron, but we wanted to give our patients a little bit of hope, so I want to put that out on the table. Another strange thing that I see is people giving patients who are core antibody positive booster vaccines in clinic. There's, I couldn't find one article in the peer-reviewed publication that this was useful. Now, we've got over 200 articles that I could find that were high quality on using quantitative S antigen, and we're having trouble getting that into our guidance documents, yet high-level providers are vaccinating core positive patients. And I don't know why, and it makes those patients think they're protected. They've been vaccinated. They, they think that there's some level of protection. The WHO and the CDC had this word natural immunity on their websites. I convinced the WHO to get that off their website because there's another oxymoron. I don't think you can have natural immunity. And I'll give you some ideas on thoughts on how that word can be replaced. Um, there's a number of uh, patient populations that are described on the CDC website where you don't actually have to do core antibody testing. They give you a different population and different set of tests. And I'm going to propose that core antibody tests should be part of every panel that's there. Of course, we're getting referred core antibody tests, the core antibody positive patients to our practice as if they're infected with hepatitis B. Well, in one way, that's probably true. But those patients, of course, aren't getting any treatment because they're core positive only. They're surface antigen negative. But they really should be educated about reactivation. And I really like this word resolved. But again, resolved doesn't mean cured. So every talk that I give to patients and providers, I just say, we have three tests, we have three interpretations, but if you're surface antibody positive, you're only immune if your core antibody test is negative, because we realize this is an incurable disease. And Dr. Protzer and I had a very nice talk yesterday afternoon, and she helped corroborate this. And Massimo, thank you also for helping me re review yesterday some of the information that I'll be presenting today. So this is the CDC website table, and I put this big, you know, red uh, box up here trying to get rid of that word natural infection and again I want to thank the WHO for embracing what the new terminology is and really it should be exposed and I'll get into a little bit more detail. So a cold hepatitis B infection I think exists. I've been doing uh, you know very sensitive DNA testing in my patients who are core antibody positive only and some of them also are core positive and surface antibody positive. And I really think that this OBI exists. This may have to do with surface antigen mutations, may have to do with the sensitivity of the S antigen tests that we're doing. And we really have to think about OBI as a different disease state. We don't understand the natural history of this yet, but it's definitely uh, ripe for uh, research. So if you take a cult and use the term occult for patients who are anti-core positive, that makes up about 6% of the U.S. population, maybe 60% of an Asian population, or 60 to 50% of IV drug users. We suddenly have a lot more people that are infected with hepatitis B. And then if you do a threshold of, let's say, 7% of those patients are core positive and have measurable DNA, 
you can then boost your prevalence state up, in the U.S. at least, by another one million people who are actually DNA positive, even though they're surface antigen negative. We also have some more sensitive hepatitis B surface antigen assays that are coming out that go down another log instead of 0.05 IUs. The next generation goes down to 0.005 IUs. So what defines surface antigen positivity is defined by the sensitivity of the test, not necessarily by, by the reality of, of the infection. So what data supports that hepatitis B is incurable? You've already heard a lot at this meeting. I'm not going to go into great detail, but I'm going to give you a little bit of some snapshots in some special clinical settings where this is important. And there's this great review um, by Lena Alweis that was just published on viruses in 2017 that I would direct you to. It's a very, very nice manuscript. I think that Dr. Protzer probably oversaw that uh, manuscript development. I thought it was very, very, very well written. So I went back and looked at this slide that we've all probably looked at 100 or 150 times. And what's very curious about this is that in this <clears throat> recovery, a resolved infection, how this core antibody, an anti-HBE, just kind of keeps going forever, right? You clear um, surface antigen, now uh, you may clear E antigen, and even in chronically infected patients, anti-HBS is up for a while, but eventually we have senescence in a large number of patients. Why does core stay up forever? I think it's reflecting ongoing uh, an intrapatic viral production. And I think another test would be actually to measure titers clinically as we're doing drug development of anti-HBC uh, core. <clears throat> and if that titer falls, I think it's going to reflect that we may actually be getting to um, not just a functional cure, but maybe closer to a sterilizing cure. I don't, I'm not going to talk too much about IgM anti-core. I'd like to highlight that even in chronic disease, patients can be anti-core IgM positive. They tend to have more active disease, a lot more inflammation. It may be a flare of liver disease. It may be a boost in HBV DNA that's present. So beware of, of uh, potentially false positive or distracting um, IgM. This goes back to core prevalence. This actually is in donors, patients that would be potential liver donors. Depends on where you are in the world, but you're going to find hepatitis B in the liver and up to 60 or 70 percent of patients in a variety of different clinical settings. And here's organ transplantation. And the reason I wanted to highlight this is this is the ultimate experiment. You give a patient who doesn't have hepatitis B, a liver from a patient who's core positive, and you put them on Prograf, uh, mycophenolate, prednisone, and you suddenly find in the unprotected setting that your transmission rate or your infection rate can be up to 100%. I think this is telling us B's not curable. Now, the other side of the story is that the recipient's been vaccinated for hepatitis B or has been previously exposed to hepatitis B, you're taking out a liver that has some hepatitis B in it and giving them a new one, the rate of new infection, de novo infection, I thought that's the right word, is much, much lower. So there is some level of immune control in those recipients, not cure, immune control that may protect them from an active hepatitis B infection. And of course, we're not giving these livers to unprotected patients anymore. We've been giving nukes or nukes plus HBIG to liver transplant recipients. HBIG is probably gone because TDF, now TAF, and entecavir are so good, we probably don't need to use hepatitis B immune globulin today. Another experiment is giving rituximab, or this is a B cell depleting agent. We have a number of different drugs in this class. And in core positive patients, you have a risk of reactivation that's between 30 and 70 percent. Take another powerful story. We're not curing patients. Patients aren't cured when they have resolved disease. They're just S antigen negative, maybe hepatitis B negative. So I want to keep this theme going that hepatitis B remains incurable. And thankfully, most of the different guidelines are now mentioning or requesting or recommending core antibody testing before you give patients some type of chemotherapy or immune suppression. And we probably have at least 100 different drugs that might fall into that classification. And the AGA came out with really, really good guidelines on how to stratify risk. Hepatitis B, C, you heard a lot about this. Uh, Jake Liang had a really nice uh, talk about this yesterday. And we obviously have this issue about hepatitis B, C interaction, which then led to the FDA giving us a black box warning on our hepatitis C drugs. And my message here is, is that you need to be measuring core antibody, looking at core antibody in all your hepatitis C patients before you treat them. Because if you don't, you're going to have decompensation, death, or liver transplant risk in those patients. 
and there's some algorithms in place on how to protect those hepatitis C patients from reactivation. So the core antibody story is becoming clearer and clearer. How we use that in our practice is becoming more clear. But how good is this assay? One of the, I call, uh, alternate facts that's out there about this core test is it has a very high false positive rate. And I believed that myself until a couple of years ago when I started looking at this core issue quite a bit more. So how did Abbott, I'm just going to use Abbott here as an example, develop a second generation test that had a very high specificity where if you see a core test, you should believe the core test is positive in that patient and it's extremely likely they have residual disease. This is from the package insert. It's a second generation chemiluminescent assay that use these uh, recombinant core antigen coated microparticles. And I'll go into a little bit more detail about that. <clears throat> they have a predefined signal to cutoff ratio, and this comes from the use of very well profiled patients. And I work with a company uh, that's based in uh, Florida to try to find patients, to get patients to the diagnostic companies where the patient's clinical history is very well defined so the companies can use those clinical scenarios to develop their assays. So <clears throat> you've got very, very nice profile patients with negative and positive controls. You've got mean values, um, coefficient of variations that are quite good. And it was designed to have an overall specificity of 99.5% in a blood donor population and 98% in a hospitalized or diagnostic population. So let's take a look at how well that goes. So blood donors. Clinical specificity, we're going to be false positive in about three per thousand patients. What about in a setting where you're thinking that somebody, or you have clinical information that those patients have had exposure to hepatitis B or have hepatitis B, our specificity here is close to 100%. So when you see a core antibody test, I tell patients or providers, the chance of that being a false positive is probably about three per thousand now. Not quite zero, but very, very low. And you can believe that patient's been exposed, and it's highly likely they have residual disease in their liver. And this is a little bit more information about false positive rate, um, looking at the Abbott Prison uh, assay as well. So how did they do this? How did the team come up with an improved core antibody test? They came up with amino acid sequences. This is a recombinant core antigen, and they use actually genotype D. They use subtype A, Y, W, 3 from the GenBank and, and felt that this was an appropriate uh, target for developing their core antibody, and there's more details here that you can take a look at um, in that publication. And this also gives you their different populations that they looked at in terms of past infection, different numbers of patients that they looked at and felt that this test was highly sensitive and specific uh, using an avidity assay that uh, was part of the um, architect core uh, uh, performance. So they looked then with their uh, assay and compared that to uh, nine core antibody tests, and I'm just going to back up for a second, and they found very, very good correlation across the different core antibody tests with only one test called the bearing test that had uh, a higher false positive rate than the rest of the assays. Another option is to look at your core antibody positive patients and look at who is anti-HBE positive because it looks like in those patients who've been exposed, if you're thinking the core is a false positive, their anti-HBE should be negative. If it's a true positive, the anti-HBE should be positive as well. And I'm going to state that that was also supported by this research uh, manuscript. So they used a serotype AYW, very well characterized specimens. They then set appropriate signal to cutoff levels. They were using anti-HBE when there's a question about the patients. They did have patients that were very low titer anti-core and brought them back for a second draw. If their second draw was negative, they were using those patients as a potential false positive. So we don't have ability to do titers in the US or obtain the titer information, but I think that would be something that would be quite useful. So I think anti-core testing is an essential part of assessing all patients. So it should be a part of any patient that's being seen for potential hepatitis B. We don't need to be selective. We don't need to be confusing about choosing two tests for one population, one test for a second population, three tests for a third population. I'm going to state that those patients who are core positive only consider testing for a, with a sensitive HPV DNA quant 
especially if patients are surface antibody negative and have evidence of elevated liver enzymes or at risk for reactivation in the immune setting or in the setting of hepatitis C, DAAs as examples. I would very much like to be seeing my core antibody titers in my patients instead of just a positive negative. And of course, we need more information on what's happening with just our core antibody assay, core antigen, and this correlated antigen. So that's a new area for research that I think needs to be um, uh, put forth. You don't need to boost patients who are core antibody positive. There's absolutely no data in the literature to support giving them vaccine. I can make a comment at the panel about where one slight twist on that. So what are the facts? Not alternate facts, but the real facts. We've got uh, hepatitis B is not curable. We can reduce CCC DNA, and I think the uh, presenters at this meeting have been very cautious about that, using the word resolved or reduced, but being very cautious about this word cure, what we're really calling sterilizing cure. Let's stop wasting money and boosting patients who are core antibody positive and giving them the feeling that they're protected in some way. Let's get rid of this oxymoron, uh, this natural immunity term. Uh, hopefully the CDC will drop that from their next version of their documents, if I can convince them. It's taken some arm twisting. And uh, I do think core antibody testing should be used in all patient populations when you're performing screening. Can we use titers? I think so. I think that's a development pathway for our future drugs. We think we're really clearing disease and having a sterilizing cure. There may need to be a discussion for S antigen mutant tests in our patient populations uh, who are core positive only, who are DNA positive. Obviously, we all need better CCC DNA assays or surrogates that are in the serum, and will core an antigen be an accurate test for presence or activity of CCC DNA? I'm going to say, to get to a cure, we have to have no CCC DNA and a biopsy, and of course, you've heard a lot about integration. So, thank you very much for having me. Hope I got my uh, message from my pulpit here to the audience, and I'll be ready to answer questions at the panel. Thank you.